How's everybody doing today? Good, good. You're a little more lively today. Caffeine kicking in? Okay, so uh, somebody pointed out to me that we have an exam in here a week from tomorrow. So they come fast and furious in this class. And if they don't, we get overwhelmed with materials. So that's the reason we have so many exams. It gives you more opportunities to excel. So hopefully that uh, helps you. Um, I haven't decided how far the material will go yet. Um, I'll let you know that closer to the exam. And we'll um, go from there. I will do a review session again. I haven't decided when that will be either. So basically, I haven't decided anything. You like that? A vote of approval from the, from the crowd. This is good. Your support means so much to me. Anyway, OK. Uh, I want to finish up DNA replication uh, and talk about some very important health considerations relevant to DNA replication. Uh, one of the things I didn't say last time about DNA repair uh, that I want to just point out to you is that if we look at DNA repair as an important cellular mechanism, uh, it has crucial importance uh, from a health perspective. When we look at people who have defective DNA repair systems for whatever reason, they usually are much more prone to cancer. Usually much more prone to cancer. Um, and uh, a prime example of that is um, there is a, uh, a, a, there are people who have deficiencies in the um, nucleotide excision repair system who are much more prone to developing colon cancer. Um, they have something like a 90% greater uh, likelihood of developing colon cancer if they inherit a certain gene. Uh, so that's uh, an important consideration. And not surprisingly, if your repair systems are not functioning properly, then when you have damage that's occurring uh, during the normal course of life, they don't get fixed, it's much more likely that mutation will happen, and as a consequence, uh, mutation leads to cancer. So that's, that's, as I said, not a surprising thing. Okay, um, somebody asked me the other day, why is it that we have uh, thymine in DNA instead of having uracil in DNA? Because uracil can pair with adenine. Why not, just have, why not just have it simple? And I think the bigger question is, why is there a uracil in RNA than there is, why is there a thymine in DNA? And the reason is because uh, uracil is um, a byproduct of the, oxidate, or of the deamination of cytosine. So if you take cytosine and you uh, allow the, the amine group to come off, and that does happen with a reasonable frequency, if you allow that amine group to come off, what happens is you create a uracil. So over time, over evolutionary time, this uh, event occurs uh, reasonably frequently uh, on a, just a chemical stability basis. So if we had uracil, I'm sorry, if, if we had uracil in our DNA in, in place of T, we would never know when cytosine was going to uracil. Our repair systems, as they currently stand, can recognize when cytosine is going to uracil and remove the uracil. If the DNA were purely uracil, that is uracil in place of thymine, the cell would have no way of knowing did that uracil get there by the breakdown of a cytosine or not. So it's a simpler scheme to have the, the setup that we describe here. Okay? So having thymine uh, there, whenever we see uracil in DNA, we assume the cell assumes it has come from deamination of a cytosine to make that. Okay, so it simplifies the repair system quite a bit. Okay, that deamination reaction is actually shown in the next slide, which is right here. You're not responsible for it, but that just shows you what's happening. So you're simply taking the amine group off and replacing it with an oxygen. Chemically, that's a very simple uh, kind of a reaction. Okay, well, the last things I want to say about DNA replication relate to replication in eukaryotes, and I hope to convince you by the end of talking about that that this is the most interesting aspect of DNA replication that, that, that we know of. Okay? So eukaryotic DNA replication is very, very interesting, and it's interesting partly because um, of the unique structures of eukaryotic uh, chromosomes. That I'll talk about in just a minute. First, though, I want to talk about the issues that eukaryotic cells have to deal with. Eukaryotic cells go through what's called a cell cycle. And that cell cycle involves controls. Controls are there to ensure that the cell is ready to replicate, is ready to divide, 
is ready to do a variety of things. That's a very important thing for a eukaryotic cell. In a multicellular organism, if the cell has, is not ready to divide, that could cause an enormous problem for the organism. If the cell has not replicated properly, that's an enormous problem for the organism because it may be full of mutation, it may be full of damage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the cell has built into it certain things called checkpoints that occur at various places during the cell cycle to ensure that the um, processes of replication and division occur uh, as they should. Okay? Now, I'll give you an example of one of these. One of these is that uh, cells have a way of checking that the DNA is in good shape and ready to be replicated. Is in good shape and ready to be replicated. What does that mean? Well, it means the following. Imagine that you've got DNA that has suffered some damage. You have repair systems that come into place that hopefully repair that damage. In most cases, they can, in fact, repair that damage. In a few cases, they cannot. Now, what you would ideally like to be able to do would be to ensure that that damage is either fixed or that cell does not go on and multiply because it may cause a cancer. Okay? Well, it turns out that our cells have an amazing system built into them that allows them to make that determination. Okay? So it's part of this checkpoint system. So to cross from one to the next to the next to the next, there are what are called checkpoints to make sure that everything is proceeding properly. Okay? One of the checkpoints occurs right here at the G1S boundary. And that G1S boundary, the checkpoint, is checking to ensure that replication is ready and good to go. Is all the damage taken care of? Is, this, is the DNA in good shape? There's, an, there's a protein that we have in our cells called P53. And P53 does just what I said. If there is unfixed damage in the DNA, P53 is activated. Okay, So P53 is a protein that's in our cells. And when there's unfixed damage, it is activated. When P53 is activated, it stimulates the production of DNA repair proteins, not surprisingly. So P53 is saying, OK, you guys didn't get it the first time around. Let's go back and see if we can fix this damage before we go on. Because if we can't, I need to know this. So the DNA repair proteins go out. They attempt to fix the damage that's there. If they fix the damage, they literally report back to P53. And P53 says, OK, we're ready to go. We proceed now to go and, and make new DNA. On the other hand, if the repair proteins are unable to fix that damage, they signal to P53. And P53 initiates a series of events that results in the cell committing suicide. Okay. So P53 is what we think of as the master control switch for the cell. It plays a very, very central and critical role in determining, is this cell going to be viable for going through division and for replication? I, I'm sorry, rep, di, replication and division. And I said it backwards, division replication. Replication and division, OK? Now, that's a very cool thing. It's a very important for a, for a, a multicellular organism to have that. Because if you don't have that, then you're going to be producing cells that may be very harmful to the organism as a whole and give rise to, to uh, be much more likely to give rise to cancer. P53, not surprisingly, is implicated in several types of cancer. It's not uncommon to discover a cancer in which P53 has been damaged. And if P53 is damaged, it's not providing that quality control that ensures that the cell commits suicide. So if that quality control is gone, then we could expect we might have a lot more problems arising. That's exactly what happens in some types, not all types, but in some types of cancer. OK, so there's one tie-in to replication that is important and interesting. There are bigger ones, OK? Now, this figure has an awful lot of stuff on it, and we're not going to go through it. You're not responsible for it. I think it's, more, it's overkill for what we want to do in this class. But there are just a couple of brief things that I want to point out to you about eukaryotic DNA replication that you need to know. Okay? 
One is a term that I should have given you for prokaryotic replication as well, and I didn't. And I'll give it to you here. It's called an origin. An origin is a place in DNA where replication starts. A replication is a place in DNA where replication starts. An origin has a specific sequence of bases. So there are proteins that recognize that sequence and say, hey, we're going to start replication, excuse me, right here at this point. Okay. So both prokaryotes and eukaryotes and viruses as well have origins, places where the replication starts. In the case of E. coli, there's one origin, one place where it starts, and then it just goes out bidirectionally from there. In eukaryotic cells, the chromosomes are so long that one origin doesn't make sense. So origins are scattered relatively frequently throughout the entire length of a eukaryotic chromosome. So, origin, so replication can start in several places at the same time. <clears throat> and that's an efficient way to do replication, especially, especially of a very large DNA. The other thing I want to say about origins um, is that um, we have some issues in eukaryotic cells that we don't have in prokaryotic cells. And the main issue that we have is that eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, not circular. In the case of prokaryotes, we can go all the way around and everybody is happy. We can tie all the loose ends together wherever we started. Okay, we can remove the excess primers. We have a perfectly a perfect copy of that um, circular chromosome in prokaryotic cells. In eukaryotes, we have linear chromosomes. And it turns out that that poses a real problem. Okay? The real problem, and I'm going to explain it to you simply, is that imagine that we start replication at the far end of a eukaryotic chromosome. So we're starting at the linear end. And one of the things that I taught you, hopefully last time, is that all DNA polymerases only work off of an existing primer. The second is that all eukaryotic, or that all polymerases only work five prime to three prime. So let's think about how we would start replication on a linear chromosome. The way that we would start it was we would have to put down an RNA primer first, which we would do, and then the DNA polymerase would attach to that primer and then elongate that to make sure that got done. That's fine and dandy until we have the, the next exonuclease that comes along and chews out that RNA primer. There's a gap that we can't fill. Because remember, we have to go 5 prime to 3 prime, which is what the RNA primer was doing. And a DNA polymerase cannot start a primer. So every time we replicate a eukaryotic chromosome, we have a little piece at the end that does not get replicated. Every time it replicates. That's true for your cells, it's true for my cells, it's true for mosquito cells, it's true for turnip cells, it's true for all eukaryotic cells because all eukaryotic cells have linear chromosomes. From a practical point of view, what that means is that my chromosomes are shorter than your chromosomes. My chromosomes are shorter than your chromosomes. The more times my cells replicate, the shorter I'm going to get because each time I lose a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay? So let's take a look at that. Okay? So this is schematically trying to show you uh, what's happening uh, with that. And it introduces a new enzyme called telomerase. And I'm going to tell you about telomerase, but the first thing I want you to do is have that mental image of your linear chromosomes getting shorter with every round of replication. Let's think about some problems that we might have with that, that shortening of the chromosomes. Okay? We have DNAs so that we can code for genes, right? So if we start shortening our chromosomes, aren't we starting to chew up our genes that we might need? And the answer is, if we 